in the past. So today um, we're welcoming in this first session, FCNL with Ellen Hester, Friends Publishing with Gabriel Erie, and also Sarah, I forget your last name, Sarah Gata, is that, are here. We're hoping that, uh, oh, here's Christian from Only Friends School, who will also be our plenary speaker tomorrow. Uh, Hilary Bergen from Quaker Voluntary Service and Mary Linda McKinney from School of the Spirit. And I'm, we're giving them each 10 minutes to talk, uh, which will take us with transition time until just about five o'clock. At that point, we will break into breakout rooms and each organization will have a separate breakout room and Bill will explain the process, but they'll be named so you can choose the one you want to go into. And we are going to keep a fairly close watch on the time so that we don't shrink, you know, shrink anybody's time at the end, give everyone <laughs> the full 10 minutes. So I've made myself a little one minute mark. I will be keeping time. And when this shows up on the screen, whoever's talking will know you have one minute left before we uh, switch on to the next organization. And I will let each, each panelist and group just introduce yourselves and however you want to tell us up to 10 minutes about whatever you'd like about your organization. So, and I'm going to go alphabetically by organization names or Friends Committee on National Legislation will be first and turn it over to Alan. Great, thank you so much. Let me see if I can get my screen share set up here. Does that show up for everybody? Perfect, great. All right, so uh, first of all, it's great to meet all of you. Um, I'm Alan Hester. I'm the legislative representative for nuclear disarmament and Pentagon spending at Friends Committee for National Legislation, on national legislation, excuse me. And I've been on FCNL's uh, staff for a little over a year now. And today I have the privilege of telling you a little bit about, about the org, and I'm gonna try to lay out what FCNL is all about as it relates to the theme of this meeting. So I'm gonna go over FCNL's roots and what guides us. I'm going to go over FCNL's oh, trunk and who gives us strength. FCNL, oh. I'll share an example of um, FCNL's fruit oh, yeah. and the work that we produce as well. So, going to FCNL's roots, um, FCNL is a nonpartisan Quaker lobby for the public interest. So, our main office is located in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're right across the street from the U.S. Senate office buildings, and we work on a wide array of domestic and foreign policy issues. Many of the policy issues that we work on revolve around international peace building, as well as pursuing economic and social justice uh, at home and abroad. And these issues are priorities that are established by our uh, general committee. Um, we pursue legislative policies that are informed by our belief that there is that of God in every person and that all creation has worth and dignity. Um, a few examples of those issues that we work on uh, include economic and environmental justice, uh, just immigration, uh, gun violence prevention, and on the foreign policy side, uh, that includes U.S. wars and militarism, international peace building, and nuclear weapons, just to name a few. And our approach to this work and our theory of change revolves around this idea um, of the importance of deep listening, of long-term relationship building with activists and policymakers, and talking to all parties and policymakers. Uh, again, we're nonpartisan and we are willing to talk with anybody who has uh, the ability to influence uh, policy in a positive way. And we work on these issues from a faith perspective, which really gives us an opening to policymakers on both sides of the aisle that a lot of other groups just don't have. Um, our faith perspective often kind of creates cracks in the traditional partisanship that we're seeing uh, in, in DC uh, more than ever these days. So FCNL's trunk, or you know, what gives us strength as an organization? Um, and I think it's really that our approach is this multifaceted approach that draws on a couple different levels. The first is uh, the expertise of expert lobbyists. So these are full-time staff that work at our DC office. Um, they're all experts in the given area that they work. Um, and on top of that, we also work with the commitment and passion of people all across the country um, in our advocacy network. And I know that there are some advocacy team members here today. Um, we have over 120 advocacy teams across the country and 
working with the lobbyists, we can be really strategic about how we engage with different members of Congress, whether we want to do constituent outreach for lobby teams that are across the country, or if we have a professional staff member in DC that has built a relationship with staff on the Hill. And those two parts of FCNL really work to cultivate long-term relationship building with policymakers and their staff. And we really approach these issues that we work on um, from a pragmatic and results-driven strategy, but we also have an ambitious vision of the world that we seek. So every year, our lobbyists come up with uh, what we call change strategies, which tries to find that balance between what's the world that we seek, what's our grandiose vision, and also what's achievable in the current political reality. So for example, in my program area, uh, we always lead our discussion on nuclear weapons with the fact that we would like to see a world free from the nuclear threat. And from there, we start working with offices and advocates to figure out what's possible uh, in the current political reality. So since many of our issues um, cannot be solved quickly, since many of these issues are difficult uh, and intractable in some cases, uh, we also work to really uplift young adults and kind of the future advocates uh, who will carry this work forward. And so we have a young adult program where we provide training and resources to empower younger advocates. We also have a program assistant program, which is where uh, for 11 months, a young professional can shadow our expert lobbyists in DC and they get hands-on experience, uh, setting up lobby meetings, being in the meetings, getting constituents to join, working with coalitions. Um, and both of these programs are really aimed at empowering the next generation of peace builders to carry this work forward, which I think gives FCNL a lot of longevity. But it is this combination of lobbyists, advocacy teams, young adult programs, and these deep relationships with policymakers that makes FCNL so effective and which really gives us a lot of longevity. So FCNL's fruit, I think the results of this approach, um, you know, we do provide a lot of educational resources that I think give a better uh, vision. It gives a better idea of the vision of the world we want to see. Um, but we really also have a lot of successes creating real policy change and making impact on people's lives in a very real way. And I don't have time to talk about all the positive change that we've done, but for this year, I thought I'd hone in on something that's accomplished uh, in my program as an example. So one of the issues that we work on in the nuclear weapons work uh, is something called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RECA. Um, when US nuclear weapons were first being produced and tested, a lot of Americans were exposed to high levels of radiation that caused a lot of health issues. Um, and those individuals uh, in communities, you know, a lot of cancer was created by, by an unhealthy amount of radiation exposure. We just didn't have that much information on what was too much radiation exposure at the time. And in fact, the real first victims of US nuclear weapons were not the victims of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but actual US citizens who were just unknowingly exposed. So the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act compensates those US victims, and that compensation is crucial for their health care costs. And we have worked to keep that program from expiring and to expand it to communities who are not currently covered. And it was actually set to expire uh, of July this year. Um, Istra Furman, who you see in the middle of this slide, was my program assistant this year. Uh, she was really drawn to this work. And due to COVID-19, she was doing her work from Texas and that ended up being really amazing because from Texas, she was able to build relationships with impacted individuals and communities, uh, local advocates in Texas and New Mexico. And she was bringing those advocates into lobby meetings uh, over Zoom, uh, which she would usually do in person in Washington, DC. And after about 10 months of embodying this approach, she was able to build Republican support uh, for, from Texas lawmakers to support extending the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. And that program was extended and signed into law this year, adding an additional two years to the program, which gives us more time to push for um, extension and a expansion of the program to other communities. So that's just one example um, of how our approach has been effective and how we make impacts. Um, and before I let you go, I thought I'd share a couple of resources if you want to learn more about what we do. I'm going to put these in the chat really quick. If I can find my way there. Let me see. I may have to close this out, actually. Oh, here we go. Perfect. So I'm sharing a link to FCNL's website where you can see all the issues that we work on. I'm also sharing a link for our governance in case you're curious about how we arrive at the issues that we work on and who's part of that process. 
Um, and then I've also shared a link to FCNL's work on Ukraine. I think that that's one of the areas that we get the most questions right now. How are we advancing nonviolent strategies and diplomacy um, after the events of the invasion of Ukraine? Um, and that link will take you to all the writing and materials that we've produced relevant to that. But it's certainly impacted almost all the issues that we work on on the foreign policy side. Um, but with that, I want to say thank you for letting me participate in this yearly meeting. It's been great to learn from all of you, and I'll pass it on to the next panelist. Thank you, Ellen. I didn't have to show the picture because it just got to there. So um, our next panelist will be from Friends Publishing, Gabriel and Sarah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to Lake Erie Yearly Meeting for uh, hosting these annual sessions online in, in a way that makes it uh, possible for us to participate from uh, from all over the place. Uh, so I'm coming to you from my home in Philadelphia. My name is Gabe, and uh, I've been with Friends Publishing since 2004 and in my current role as executive director since 2011. So uh, happy to share about, uh, about my organization, uh, starting with the roots. So Friends Publishing uh, got its uh, start uh, in, back in 1827, uh, publishing a magazine called The Friend. And at the time, uh, we had, uh, uh, not unlike we do now, uh, differing factions in the Religious Society of Friends. And The Friend was, uh, uh, was coming out of the Orthodox uh, uh, side of uh, mostly Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Um, in 1844, an arrival arose in the Friends Intelligencer uh, from the uh, representing the Hicksite uh, Friends. And um, one of the neat things about this organization is that it actually came into being uh, in the merger of these two uh, these two Quaker groups. Um, uh, in 1955, when the when the Hicksite and Orthodox branches reunited in Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, they actually combined organizations and joined forces to create in 1955 what has been uh, continuously published since then as Friends Journal. So for a long time, we've been Friends Journal, uh, and uh, so Friends Journal uh, is a uh, has has been a magazine. Uh, largely circulated among Quakers for a very long time, uh, and which has flourished now for 67 years. Uh, we are a monthly uh, monthly publication now uh, uh, in color since 2013 with readership worldwide. And uh, we have a we have a mission which um, I like to spend a little bit of time on because I think it uh, it explains what um, what we try to do. Um, our mission is to communicate Quaker experience in order to connect and deepen spiritual lives. And I, I'd like to point out a couple things about this. The mission is not just to communicate Quaker experience to Quakers. Um, it's really to communicate what Quakers experience in our, in our faith, in our meetings, in our religious experience uh, outward among Quakers, but also to the world. Um, it also, uh, emphasizes that we really serve to connect people. Um, what any of us experiences in our own Quaker meeting is, is fairly limited and it can be profound. Um, but what I think is wonderful about media is that we have the ability to take Quaker perspectives, Quaker ministries, Quaker testimonies, and really re refine, curate, and bring them out into the world where anybody can access them. So, you know, for the, for the first um, uh, century of our existence, almost uh, uh, in, as a as a publishing concern, you really would have had to walk into a Quaker's living room or into a meeting house in order to um, you know encounter what we uh, you know what we encapsulate in our pages. And um, what's exciting now is that anybody with an internet connected device anywhere can um, can you know read uh, an article that one of you may have written 
uh, or watch a video that uh, that uh, one of you appears in or that that features one of our great Quaker organizations uh, and among uh, among the partner partnering organizations that we feature include I think all of the organizations who are participating in this panel which is really cool um the branches of our work now include not just the magazine but our websites uh, we have friendsjournal.org uh, we have Quaker Speak, the uh, video series, which we uh, started in 2013. And we have Quaker.org, which uh, we are building out to be a, a place for people to find basic information about Quakers. So delving down a little bit more into what these have, uh, friendsjournal.org is now the world's largest free archive of Quaker content. Uh, every Friends Journal since 1955 is scanned and available. Uh, there's no paywall. Uh, so really the entire um, history of, of, of all of the, the thought and spirit that has gone into uh, the Friends Journal is available to anybody. And, and this the website reaches hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. Um, the print magazine continues. Uh, it's been uh, recently redesigned to make it more readable. Um, and we really try to cover uh, both uh, news among the Quaker world. Uh, we have feature articles about topics that are important to us uh, as friends. And we are really trying to live into um, live into our uh, our place in the religious society of friends to hold space for important conversations. Um, and so one of the uh, magazine covers you see here is from the March issue this year, where we talked about safety in meetings. Um, and we, it was a really, I think, um, important issue, uh, a Friends Journal for the Religious Society of Friends, because um, we need to be a safe religious community. And we, uh, what we learned as we were putting this together, that there were a lot of individuals from across Quakerism who felt like they were alone in worrying about harassment or um, mistreatment of various forms of behavior that occur among humans and also in our Quaker meetings and that can lead to an unsafe environment. And so in addition to um, covering this topic uh, in the articles in that issue, we um, arranged a, a panel discussion where we brought together authors from that issue um, and all sorts of in interested folks from across the country um, to, to talk about these things and talk about how we can make our meetings safer. Um, and I, that's the kind of thing that is, again, is something that technology is enabling, which is really exciting um, because it opens up new avenues for us in our work. Quaker Speak, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, now publishes 20 plus new videos a year. Uh, we're up to over four and a half million views. Um, and uh, this is a project where we are using uh, the medium of video to introduce people anywhere to uh, Quakers, what we think about, what we talk about, how we practice our faith. Um, and it's been really um, exciting to see uh, how many, how many uh, you know, friends I'm introduced to um, through watching these videos and and how many people are encountering Quakers for the first time in such a you know a, a connected way um, through this uh, through this project. Here are a few of the uh, recent videos that we've um, that we've featured this season. Um, and uh, if you haven't uh, kept up with Quaker Speak, I encourage you to click on over to QuakerSpeak.com and uh, sub subscribe so that you learn when there's a new video. Um, but we really uh, try to cover uh, not only the basics of Quakerism, but delving a little bit deeper. And we've found some really interesting folks to talk to, um, inclu including um, uh, the, those you see here. Uh, and then finally, our newest, uh, our newest project is Quaker.org, which we're building out to be a hub for basic information for people new to Quakers. And all of these, uh, all of these uh, websites, friendsjournal.org, quakerspeak.com, quaker.org, uh, lead people to ask, where can I find Quakers? And I'm happy to report that uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people every, every month are using our online meeting listings to, um, once they've gotten hooked, to, to find real life Quaker communities that they might, they might connect to, which is exciting. 
Um, so these are our websites. Um, I, I hope that you'll check them out. They've been recently redesigned and uh, there's really a treasure trove of content there. Um, how can we? How can you share in these fruits? Um, if you're not already uh, uh, with us, you can visit friendsjournal.org/join. Get our free emails. Uh, we we feature new articles about three times a week, and a new video or a classic video once a week in our email newsletters. Um, you can share our websites with people that you know who might want to learn more about Quakers or to go deeper. Um, and you can make a gift. And many of you, uh, I thank you for being donors and members of Friends Publishing. Friends Publishing is an independent Quaker nonprofit and donor support makes it possible. Um, and as a meeting, you can use Friends Journal articles and Quaker Speak videos for discussion starters and religious education in your meeting. Uh, you can embed qu the Quaker Speak videos uh, on your meeting's website, uh, which is an, an easy way to uh, liven it up and um, to greet people that may be checking you out online before they check you out in person. And um, one last thing I wanted to say is that we're trying to get better. We want to understand more about um, the people that read and watch, uh, the people in the Quaker community whom we serve. Um, and so we are working with a strategic planning consultant to help us figure out how to improve our, our, our mission. And uh, so there's a, there's a survey that is live and that uh, Sarah has shared the link to. Um, I believe in the chat. And I wanted to thank everybody for uh, for your time and uh, look forward to question and answer in the uh, breakout groups. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Gabe. Um, it's going to be hard to choose which group to go to <laughs> at the end, but we'll, they'll all be there. Um, next, um, we will have Christian Achima, who is the head of Only Friends School, um, who's closer to home. Um, so, We'll turn it over to you, Christian. Great, thank you very much, Susan. And thank you very much to those who've organized this uh, yearly meeting. I hope that I'm coming through and you can hear me. I'm going to try and speak slowly because uh, most folks don't really understand my accent. So uh, just let me know if there are things that you don't understand and need me to slow down a little bit more and I will. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. And as far as All New Friends School goes, with our history uh, founded in 1837 uh, by the rural farmers, Quaker farmers, who wanted a safe place for their children to go to school and pretty much protect them from the outside world, and also allow them to experiment a little bit, but within the confines of the Quaker testimonies. And to this day, surely even in uh, Barnesville, where we are based, we have people who uh, do not know what happens back there uh, on that farm. And when they come to interview for jobs, for example, or just pop onto campus, they say, we didn't know all these buildings were here. We didn't know that you had this school here. So we still have that legacy of a kind of a buffer. Uh, and it has helped us as well uh, during this pandemic. So that, that's that legacy issue. As far as our mission, I think it's really stayed the same since the founding, except a, a little bit keeping with the times as well. Uh, right now, we do our very best to prepare our students to uh, go out in the world and spread good. And we do that in a couple of ways. There is, of course, the academic side where you have to uh, you know, prepare students to go on and thrive in college and uh, post high school education. But beyond that, provide that framework where if they're out in the world, not necessarily in the academic world, they can seek to create common meanings and understandings with different people who might not look like them, who might not speak like them, who might not really care about the same things, but deep down what is there. And we really try to model that at the school uh, through, and that's, that's, that's been a sustaining mission for us. And the worst thing for me as a head of school is for a parent to say, my child left all here and couldn't survive a week in, in a youth hostel in Europe, or couldn't survive two weeks in college, then I feel we felt the student. And uh, uh, the good thing, we haven't had those complaints in a few years. So, you know, we, there's that renewed focus on vigor and rigor in everything we do, but of course, always guided by the spices. 
And I say that very seriously because every time I've been to a meeting of uh, friends, heads of school, I'm always reminded, they say, you are that school. Uh, you are that school in Ohio where you actually practice Quakerism. You don't just talk about it. You practice it and live it. And I say, yes, that's the school. And that's what makes it uh, simultaneously rewarding uh, and also intense because it takes an investment of your whole self uh, in the school and in the students. And that is exactly what makes it uh, worth uh, uh, living there, worth uh, working there. And then it becomes uh, more than a job. It really becomes a part of who you are. Uh, I, I didn't know that I would be at only at this point in my career, but uh, now that I'm in it, I, do, I don't know how I, I could be anywhere else but only, and uh, that, that I'm grateful for as an alum of the school. As far as our outcomes, I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the fruits, the leaves, I'll say there are many. We could go on for a week, but this past academic year, I was especially touched by the way uh, the, our community welcomed a student from uh, Afghanistan who had gone to uh, Islamabad to get her visa, and she took that trip on her own. She got her visa, went back to Kabul, and the day she got to Kabul, that's when Kabul fell. So she had to figure out a way to get herself on a flight uh, to Europe, which she did. And she kept on writing me and saying, do I still have a place at all? And I said, you do. And you've had a visa. So you have the US visa, please get here. All you need to do is to get here and we'll sort out the rest. And you know, this, 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 this wonderful, wonderful student showed up. She sent me an email saying, I'm now in Munich. The Germans are going to let me in without a Schengen visa because I have a US visa. Will you still pick me up at the airport? I said, Solny, of course, we'll pick you up from the airport. And sure enough, two days later, uh, through another circuitous route through Switzerland and all, she made it to Pittsburgh. We picked her up very shy at first, didn't know what to do. And I know how we had to you know, just meet her exactly where she was. And that is, that's the power again, that is the, the community uh, beauty of all anywhere. We said we need to suspend all of our suppositions and reconceptions about the student. None of us has been to, you know, to live in Afghanistan the way she has. None of us has been to Islamabad to get a visa. So listen to what the student's saying. And slowly but surely, we got to know uh, the student. Slowly but surely, she got to, you know, getting warm and trusting with us. Slowly but surely, we got to say things we took for granted. Uh, playing soccer, for example, said, I can't believe it. Today I'm going down to play soccer. I've never played soccer ever. I've never had the opportunity to play soccer. And I'm playing soccer with other students. I'm playing soccer with boys. This is something different. And so bits and pieces kept on coming and then she just was so wonderful in educating the community about uh, Islam, why she still practiced, why it was important for us to recognize Ramadan. And our kitchen manager just swung into action and made sure she had the meals she needed at the time she needed during uh, the fasting period and other students filled in. So for me, that story exemplifies the kind of fruits that come from uh, 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 just exposing yourself to only giving your all to it because um, th th that story is it's going to be with her and she loves the school so much to the point she's told her other, we've seen a, a rise in applications from Afghanistan uh, largely because of her saying, yeah, this school just doesn't talk about inclusion and bring everyone in. It means it and walks the talk. So surely we do stumble from time to time, but that is one of the things I wanted to highlight as an outcome. I'm sorry, I quickly passed by what are current initiatives. We continue to have a certified organic USDA organic farm. That's key for us, a key belief that you need to get your hands dirty, know where your food comes from, know where your uh, you know, animal produce comes from. And also the stewardship part, 
uh, taking care of our environment, knowing what goes into our bodies and doing that physical work without a janitorial staff. So that continues and it is you know, a thriving farm just coming, coming up over and over again. We keep saying, how do we invest more into the farm? How do we integrate our farm and classroom and kitchen to make it uh, seamless all under the umbrella of uh, the Quaker testimonies. So, and that's now what we encapsulated in our transdisciplinary curriculum that aims to answer questions that transcend uh, disciplinary boundaries. And that's really answering questions that strike at the heart of humanity that you can't just answer with you know, a single discipline or a flippant answer. You have to reflect, you have to draw on different faculties, you have to draw on your mind, your heart, your soul to really engage with these kinds of enduring questions. So that is my little introduction to Only Friends School. I have many stories and everything else we can hear in the breakout room. And if you can still hear me now say, okay, this is the power of connectivity and Zoom. I'm on, I'm on my annual leave in Uganda and I'm still able to connect with you. So uh, wonderful to be here once again. Thank you so much, Christian. Coming to us from Uganda, that's amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, and we welcome our next speaker from QBS Quaker Voluntary Service, um, Hil Hilary Bergen. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a delight to get to hear the other speakers as well. Uh, my name is Hilary Bergen. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Massachusetts. And I've been in this role for Quaker Voluntary Service um, as the executive director for almost four years. And before that, I was the coordinator in the, for the Boston program and um, had the delight to get to open that program in 2015. So I have the joy of getting to see QBS from a couple different standpoints. And I loved the, the request for this um, root trunk branches. And I'd love to share a slideshow with you all. See if this works. All right, can you you can see it? Yeah, great. So um, here are some trees. <laughs> um, on the left, we have a photo of the Bo current Boston coordinator, my colleague Zenaida Peterson, and the fellows that were in Boston this year. And um, on the right, we have a photo of a couple of us staff on our staff retreat. So our roots. I don't know how many of you know, excuse me, know Pando. It is a stand yeah. of quaking aspens in Utah. And quaking aspens are all connected in the roots. So all of these trees are connected. It is the heaviest organism on earth. And um, I really see our friends' communities uh, encapsulated in Pando and vice versa. Uh, we depend on one another, we grow together, we support one another as, um, as some trees start decomposing. And um, I'm glad to be coming out of this root system. We began in 2009 and in 2009, there was a great, great convening at Pendle Hill and um, Christina Repoli, who's in the middle here was led as a young adult to, to consider a question of how do we have opportunities for Quaker youth to do service through a Quaker lens. And through that time, the founding board discerned this was the time for us to start a Quaker organization. And the first cohort began in 2012. On the right, you can see our delightful first fellows and now they're fully 10 years out of their program year almost and um, one of them is on our board and one of them was on our staff for seven years so we're really involved with our alum in a variety of ways the trunk where we are now um this is a photo from uh let's see august of last year of our current fellows and it was you know august 2021 some people wearing masks. We had to figure out a lot about COVID, um, but we're still here. So 
Also, you might be able to hear the toddler in the background who is my housemate, but not my child. And I apologize, um, but he's very cute and having a nice time. Anyways, um, our vision and our mission, we are in the process of doing some poetry work with these and maybe reconsidering exactly how they're worded, but I think the um, sentiment remains. Our vision is we envision a society in which young adults are empowered to discern and live into their gifts and callings. We believe in the power of spirit-led individuals to create communities of solidarity, equity, and compassion. We imagine a world of transformed relationships with the divine, with each other, and across communities. And our mission is to enable lives of prophetic service. We support and empower young adults to explore their spirituality and vocation while living in intentional Quaker community. We increase the capacity of social change organizations and we partner with Quaker meetings and churches, building new leadership for the Religious Society of Friends and the world beyond. So what we do, we have young adults who live together in community. It's an immersive experience. They are engaging in Quaker deep, you know, spiritual deepening how that relates to social change work, to the nonprofit that they're working in, to how they're living with one another. And it's uh, an opportunity for young adults to also be working in relationship with existing organizations who are in the community and of the community. So here we have a photo, actually the person in the middle is now a coworker of mine. She's an alum, Miranda, she's the, uh, Twin Cities coordinator and also the administrative um, coordinator. So when the fellows live together, they are using Quaker processes. They're having a Quaker business meeting once a week. They are um, having attending Quaker meeting or Quaker church in the city that they're placed in. And they also have support from a spiritual nurturer from one of the local meetings or churches and from the staff person. They're participating as um, in service through nonprofits that they're working with. So um, we have fellows working at the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW. Um, this one fellow got to be at the UN, you know, meetings about international nuclear disarmament. Um, we've had fellows who work with grant making organizations in Philadelphia supporting small grassroots organizations through um, through grants, a number of different kinds of, of work. And the fellows are trying on quote unquote Quaker practices. Um, one statistic I find very interesting is, you know, most of our fellows are actually not Quaker when they come to QVS. And it's not our goal for to make more Quakers but we do believe that Quakerism has something to offer. And so that's the lens that we use. And fellows uh, do during their year find a lot of um, synergy and alignment with Quakerism, as you can see. So where we are now, um, these are our branches, our outcomes. We've been in five cities, Atlanta, the Twin Cities, Portland, Oregon, um, Boston, and Philadelphia. And so in the last 10 years, we've had 270 young adults. I think that's fantastic. The number at the end of this year will be close to 300, which 10 years ago, I think the, the founders really would have um, been excited and surprised. You know, they started out with, I think, seven or eight fellows that first year and have grown enormously. This upcoming year, we will not be in Atlanta. We're taking a hiatus from the Atlanta program, but we'll continue in Boston, the Twin Cities, Philadelphia, and Portland. And during this time, I think since I've been on staff, I find um, as a staff person, the staff are, are really important to me. And I think that makes sense given my position. Um, these are my colleagues who I know um, how hard they work and how transforming their work is. Um, we've had the opportunity to employ 17 city coordinators. And I would say that the vast majority of those individuals have been alum. And so continuing to be a part of 
the vocational journeys of fellows when they become alumni has has become um, a you know an offshoot, a delightful offshoot of of our work. The budget that first year in 2012 was 160,000, and now we are at close to a million. And we have created an endowment and received first estate gifts. And um, we started the endowment through a gift from the Pickett Foundation when they were ready to lay themselves down. And I think one, the, the thing that is, um, so this is kind of like the nuts and bolts, what is QBS? What's been on my mind and heart most recently is um, a part of our work that I didn't realize we do so much of, but we do a lot of translating between generations. And I'm acutely aware of this right now because the fellows that we work with had previously, thank you, Susan, had previously been um, millennials and I'm a millennial. I intuitively can understand folks kind of in my generation. Um, and Gen Zers feel pretty different to me. I makes me feel old, which I get laughs from other older friends about. And um, and the culture has really shifted. And what's interesting here, you'll see our generations. You know, our fellows. Each star shows you know a couple fellows, and they're all Gen Z just about. There's a couple that are still on the cusp. Staff are majority millennial. And then most of our donors and volunteers at local meetings are Gen X and, and above. And one thing that to me um, encapsulates this translation is a lot of our fellows talk about being anti-capitalist. And I was talking to a colleague who um, is in his late 50s and he said, well, when I was a young person, when I was growing up, capitalism was the good guy against communism. And it's, you know, this ingrained piece about what does capitalism mean? I think when many of our fellows use the word capitalism, what they're talking about more is the inequity that they see, the wealth inequity, racial inequity, um, capitalism encapsulates so much more than just a way of using money. And um, and it's it's challenging. It's challenging to translate. So I um, I'm so glad I got to talk to you all, and hopefully I'll speak more with some of you later. Um, I have a couple of links that I'll also um, drop in the chat. So there's an e-newsletter link and our website. And um, if you want to email me, go for it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Hillary. Well, this is a full full session. There's a lot lot here, but thank you all. And our last presenter, before we go into the small groups, is Mary Linda McKinney from School of the Spirit, and we welcome you. You're muted. Great. I'm really glad to be with you today um, to talk about the Faithful Meetings program of the School of the Spirit. It's our latest program, but it occurred to me as I was planning this that many of you may not know about the School of the Spirit. So I'll give you some back information about it first. Um, so School of the Spirit was started 30 years ago when Catherine Damiano, Fran Tabor, and Sonny Kronk felt that friends needed more opportunities for spiritual deepening and growth. They began worshiping, praying, and studying together regularly and invited others to join them. Out of this grew the leading to form a class, which grew into the On Being a Spiritual Nurturer program. The School of the Spirit was created to support this program. Over, to, over time, other programs were offered, including our ongoing contemplative retreats program, while the Spiritual Nurturer program remained the foundation of the organization. There have been 11 spiritual nurturer classes over the past three decades with something like 22 people in each. That seems like a really small number, but these few hundred people have had an inordinate impact on friends. In just the past few years, the number of SN grads who have clerked FGC gathering or their yearly meeting or vital committees is surprisingly large. 
Graduates of the Spiritual Nurture Program, myself included, have felt our lives transformed by our deepened connection with the divine. And most of us have taken what we were given in the program into many other Quaker spaces and into the larger world. And yet, the enrollment was down considerably for the two most recent spiritual nurturer classes. This caused the board of the School of the Spirit to step back and go into a period of discernment, asking God if it was time to end the On Being a Spiritual Nurturer program. And if so, was it time to lay our organization down? After much consideration and prayer, Spirit guided us to put the Spiritual Nurturer program on hold to recreate a new later, and also assured us there was still much work for the School of the Spirit to do. This led us to a long period of discernment in which we talked with one another, worshiped and prayed together, and invited many different friends to tell us about their spiritual needs. The needs that were shared really meshed with what we'd heard from many conversations with spiritual nurturer grads. Folks would go through the spiritual nurturer program, have transformative experiences, but find that their meetings didn't know how to receive or integrate the ministries and energies that were coming through them. From that time of discernment, the School of the Spirit Board was given the leading to provide spiritual formation grounded in Quaker faith and practices to Quaker meetings. Spirit gave it to me to be the creator and first facilitator of the Faithful Meetings Program, and I'd like to share a slideshow with you about the program. School of the Spirit program. We ask, in conversations formal and casual, by email, poll, Zoom, and in person, with folks who are active in their meetings and others who've moved on, we asked, what do you yearn for in your friend's community? Over and over, what we heard was more. Friends want more. More spiritual intimacy. More emotional depth. More opportunities to learn. To be known. To know. To practice accountability together. More occasions for connection, to listen to one another, to listen for the still small voice within and time to talk about what they hear. Friends want more opportunities to hear how the spirit is working in the lives of friends now, as well as how earlier friends learn to be faithful to their leadings. Friends told us they didn't feel they could bring their fullest selves into their spiritual communities because of who they are, where they come from, or what they believe. Friends young and old, birthright and brand new, and members of unprogrammed and programmed meetings all expressed a similar yearning for meaningful connections in their Quaker communities. Christian, non-theist, and a spectrum of beliefs in between, friends told us they want more openings to explore what they believe in a space that is spiritually rooted and welcoming. Friends meetings often don't know how to create this space. Cultural conformity substitutes for unity or understanding. A desire to avoid conflict discourages authenticity. Quaker process and traditions sometimes obscure seeking the will of the divine. Quaker communities have good intentions, but many have lost touch with the wisdom of earlier friends. 
Faithful meetings will provide Prince communities with what they need to rediscover roots of our faith and to explore new models for faithfulness. During the opening retreat of this nine month program, everyone in the Friends meeting will begin to share their spiritual stories with one another. They will have the opportunity to talk about their understanding of the divine and to put words to spiritual experiences they have in and out of worship. Importantly, Friends will also begin the practice of naming what they experience with one another. Being in relationship with God and with one another is the foundation of the practice of eldering. When we talk about ways we see one another live up to the light, we help one another grow spiritually. The purpose of faithful meetings is not to teach a specific theological orientation, but to provide meetings with an understanding of the depth and width of Quaker spiritual practices. During the opening retreat, small groups will be formed with the intention of mutual accountability centered in spiritual and emotional intimacy. These groups will meet monthly. The entire Friends Meeting will also meet monthly to study and reflect on aspects of Quaker practices. Quaker communities today do not resemble those of our ancestors. Friends' lives are hectic and many do not feel strongly rooted in community. Faithful Meetings is designed to meet friends where they are and be accessible to a wide range of busy people. The essence of faithful meetings, the very seed, is to cultivate heightened awareness of the more that friends experience in meeting for worship and to recognize it is always present. If you'd like more information about this nine-month program, you can visit schoolofthespirit.org um, or email me and I'll put the information in the chat in just a moment. And my gratitude to Muriel Anderson for the wonderful music that we have here. Oh, thank you. Thank you all very much.